This morning, let's take our Bibles and turn to the Old Testament book of Job, chapter 32. Job chapters 32 through 37, Job's frustration. And we can also say Jerry's frustration as we work through the book of Job. Uh, not for the faint of heart, but when you go verse by verse, as God commissioned us, you get the whole counsel of God. This is the quintessential book on suffering. And it's going to show us the attitudes of Job and his friends about suffering. And with all these chapters, as so much in our life, we're going to find out at the end of this that we know nothing about why we suffer. Not going to learn a thing. But we're going to learn a lot about what not to do in suffering and what not to do in counseling. And unfortunately, much of our lives, maybe most of our lives, will be spent suffering in one form or another. We need to learn how to go through it, and this book is going to teach us how to go through it. It all begins in chapter 1, and no one knows about this among our characters. Job doesn't know it, his friends, but it all begins in heaven. Uh, chapter 1, verse 1, Job was a man who was blameless, upright, he feared God, and he shunned evil. That's the testimony of Job. He was not sinning, he was not doing anything wrong to bring about these events. What happened was, God started this off. One day when all the angels and the bad angels or demon spirits came and presented themselves in submission to God, God opened this up in verse 7 by talking to the angel who had gone bad at that point. Lucifer had become Satan. And the word Satan there really means an adversary. He was the adversary of God and the adversary of God's people. And he said, uh, from where did you come? And he said, going to and fro on the earth and walking back and forth on it, probably indicating that this was his domain. Is this Satan's world? Jesus says it is. Paul says it is. God of this age, prince of this world. He's in charge right now. God's over him, but he's giving him a lot of license. And um, God opens this up in verse uh, 8, and he says, Have you considered my servant Job? that there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So God is offering Job as an example of a godly man. Satan counters by saying, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, around all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and have increased in the land. So why wouldn't he be praising you? You're blessing him. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. So God says, all right. All that he has is in your hand, your power. Don't lay a hand on his person. Satan went out, destroyed his family, killed his kids, uh, destroyed the servants, the cattle, and the, all the animals were dispersed. Job had been the wealthiest man in all the east and uh, perhaps the wisest one. And what did Job do? Verse 20, he tore his robe, shaved his head, fell on the ground, and worshipped God. Verse 21, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. All right, another day comes, and all the angels, the good angels, the bad angels, come before God, and the Lord opens this thing up again, and he says, have you considered Job, etc., etc.? And uh, Satan counters in verse 4, skin for skin. Job will surrender the skin of his kids to protect his own skin. Skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. So as long as he can protect his person, somebody take a shot at his person, touch his flesh, touch his bone, he'll cur curse you to your face. And God said, okay, he's in your hand, but spare his life. And then God allowed Satan to go out and strike Job with boils. We saw uh, in discussing this, this is a condition which we would know today as pemphigus foliosus. That's the closest we can tell from all the scriptures. 
uh, and he had inflamed ulcerous sores, itching, degenerative changes in facial skin, loss of appetite, depression, loss of strength, worms in the boils, running sores, difficulty in breathing, darkness under the eyes, foul breath, loss of weight, continual pain, restlessness, blackened skin, peeling skin, fever. And you thought you weren't feeling so well this morning, huh? So this is the condition he's in. And yet he still does not curse God. But Satan and God preserve the wife. And what does she have to say? Verse 9 of chapter 2. Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Isn't that sweet? That's the little woman at home and what she's having to say. Mouthpiece for Satan. So Satan was wise. He kept her around because he knew that she would be no, not a strong spiritual help to him, and she wasn't. There's no indication she's any help to him spiritually at all in this journey. Well, Satan's got more in how he keeps the wife around. That'll be making him depressed. But he also has three friends. These friends come, verse 11, they have nothing to say, verse 13, for seven days and seven nights. They are shocked at his condition. But then uh, Job begins to complain. In verse 3, he talks about, uh, chapter 3, he talks about deploring his birth, hates the fact that he was born, wishes that he could die or had been stillborn. So the friends now want to defend God. And instead of counseling and comforting Job, they're going to attack him. And so Eliphaz is the first of the friends, chapter 4. He says, Job, God's good. God wouldn't do this to you. Therefore, if you have adversity, you must be bad. You must be sinning. And so chapter 4, Job is sinning in Eliphaz's eyes. We know that's not true because he was blameless and upright. And so now chapter 5, uh, Job says, I'm being chastened by God. Uh, chapter 6, he's complaining about his condition. Well, the next friend goes on, Bildad, he says again, Job, you're a sinner. You need to repent. Job defends himself. And then we have a third friend, Zophar. Job, you're sinning. You need to repent. Then everything's going to be fine. And um, he's like some of these prosperity teachers on television here. God just loves you. He just wants to shower you with blessings, and that's the full gospel. No. The full gospel is I'm a sinner. I need to come to the Lord, repent. And yes, God will bless, but he'll also allow suffering for proving faith. What is God trying to do through this whole exercise? He's trying to show Satan and all the angels and us that a godly person will not curse God. Now, that doesn't mean that person's not going to complain. And we see now, for the first round of the friends accusing him and is defending himself, the second round, they come back and do it all over again, nothing new. The third round, we ended up last week, so three rounds, they're all complaining about him, saying you've sinned. He says, I haven't sinned. And yet James in the New Testament talks about the patience or the perseverance of Job. And yet we see this book riddled with complaints against God by Job. Job's attitude is pretty straightforward. Job is telling uh, the friends that they're no friends. God's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He could have prevented this. He hasn't prevented this, and I've done nothing to bring this on. Therefore, God's being unfair. And I want someone to take me before God so I can give God my defense and a piece of my mind. So he wants an intermediary, an intercessor, not to save him, but to give him an audience before God. The friends keep saying, you're a sinner. That's why you're in this condition. And we're not getting anywhere. It goes on and on, around and around. Um, incidentally, we find the same thing in suffering. Until we go to God and say, Lord, you are omnipotent. You always work things together for good. I can't see the good, but I'm going to worship you and I'm going to trust you. When we can do that, then we're fine. But as long as we complain, we're getting nowhere. But what is this matter of the perseverance of Job? Perseverance does not mean you don't complain. Perseverance means you hang in there, you remain. 
Years ago, I was very unhappy having to go from my wonderful bachelor pad to buying a home to take care of mother and dad who couldn't work in an assisted living and nursing home environment, and I had to become the head caretaker. And I was not happy. I did not want to do that. I had no training in nursing, medicine, or anything else. And to have to take care of them from four at night until eight the next morning alone every night for seven years didn't make me happy. And I complained. And uh, my brother would call me on Saturdays. We would talk, and I would vent. And he'd say, now listen, God does not recommend that you vent, but better to vent and still remain with God than to turn from God. So don't be so unhappy with yourself. Just hang in there and ask God for patience. My beloved secretary, Barbara, used to say, Pastor, this will not last forever. I took that to mean I won't last forever, but she said, this won't last forever. And it didn't. And I had a chance to close their eyes and to see them move on with the Lord. And I am grateful for that time we had. So perseverance does not mean that you're always happy. It doesn't mean you don't complain, but you hang in there and you don't desert your post. You love God. You don't curse him. And Job is doing that. He's, as long as he's complaining about God, at least he's connecting with God. And the same in a marriage. There are those who complain about each other, and we shouldn't do that. Parents with kids, kids with parents, husbands and wives, we shouldn't do that, but we do it. But that's not the worst situation. The worst situation is when the complaining stops and there's no healing and there's divorce or there's running away from home, what have you. Then there's no communication at all. So this goes on and on. We've heard from the friends. We've heard from Job. And now there's one more person. We're going to cover him today. And then next week, we're going to see how this all turns out and how the answer really is going to come when God speaks. See, God hasn't talked all this time. When God opens his mouth, that's going to change the whole thing. Well, chapter 32, we're going to see a young man named Elihu coming on the scene. And he is very wordy. And uh, he has held back because in that day, the younger people usually respected the older people and they waited for the older people to have their say. But he has listened to these older people. He thinks they're full of hot air and there's no wisdom like my wisdom. And that's what he's going to come on with right now. Uh, and so Job has to suffer this young man uh, who thinks that he is just the wisest of all and full of self. Reminds me of the old saying that Mark Twain had. Mark said that when I was 16, my parents were so dumb. When I was 21, it's amazing how much they learned in five years. And so there's no wisdom like a very young person's wisdom when he's trying to educate an older person. Chapter 32, we're going to look at Job suffering a young fool. This Elihu is going to contradict Job's friends, claim that he alone has wisdom, and he will now answer Job. Uh, chapter 32, I think, has a lesson. Youth often exaggerates its own wisdom. So true. Chapter 32 of Job, verse 1. So these three men ceased answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. And while Job did not sin to bring on these attacks and problems, he was sinning along the way by his complaining, persevering, but still sinning. Complaint is a sin. The Israelites suffered greatly from God in the wilderness by their complaining. And so he is sinning as he's going along, and he is very self-righteous. And they're trying to tell him not to be self-righteous. We're going to see next week that the only way to end self-righteousness is for someone to see the Lord. If you want to pray for self-righteousness to end for yourself or somebody else, say, Lord, show yourself. When we see the Lord, when we see Jesus, self-righteousness goes right out the window. Chapter 32, verse 2. The wrath of Elihu was aroused against Job. His wrath was aroused because he justified himself rather than God. And he was doing that. He was saying, I'm righteous and I'm right. What God's doing is not fair. Verse 3, against his three friends, his wrath was aroused because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. That's true. They didn't find any answer for the problem that Job had. And they continued to condemn him. Verse 4, because they 
They were years older than he. He waited to speak. But then when he was ready, he began to open his mouth. Verse 6, I'll give you an idea of how windy this young fellow is. I am young in years, and you are very old. Therefore, I was afraid and dared not declare my opinion to you. I said age should speak, and multitude of years should teach wisdom. But there is a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. Great men are not always wise, nor do the aged always understand justice. That's true. No fool like a young fool, no fool like an old fool either. So I said, verse 10, listen to me. I will also declare my opinion. Indeed, I waited for your words. I listened to your reasonings while you searched out uh, what to say. I paid close attention, etc. But now it's my turn. And he's going to talk about his wisdom. Chapter 33, and this is all about Elihu today. Job is not going to open his mouth in this series. He did in the first three rounds when his friends talked. He opened his mouth. You know why he's not talking now? This has been going on a long time long time. Ever go fishing, anybody? You ever fish? Did you ever get a good fish on the other? They line the biggest fish around, and it was a lot of work, right? And you just keep holding on and holding on, and then suddenly there's not much there, and you just reel it in. What happened? The fish got played out, didn't he? Job is played out. There comes a time when we're even tired of complaining, even tired of defending ourselves, even tired of the discussion. My mother used to say, and I picked up the same phrase, I'd look in the mirror and say, self, you bore me. You get to the point of saying, I've had enough. I'm even tired of my own voice. So, chapter 33, please, Job, hear my words. Listen to all my words. Now I open my mouth. My tongue speaks in my mouth. My words come from my upright heart. My lips utter pure knowledge. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. If you can answer me, set your words in order before me. Take your stand. Truly, I am as your spokesman before God. I also have formed, was formed out of clay. Surely no fear of me will terrify you, nor my hand be heavy on you. So that was before the days of tweeting. And how many uh, words can you put into a tweet? I don't know. Very few, right? Today, everything is bottom line. You, you text the kids, the kids text you back, so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, yeah. You know, just real brief. So-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, yeah. Uh, but not in this day. They didn't have television, didn't have tweeting, didn't have uh, the texting. And uh, nothing to do but sit around and talk. Um, verse 8, surely you have spoken in my hearing. I've heard the sound of your words. I am pure without transgression. I am innocent and there is no iniquity in me. Isn't that wonderful? So uh, this is how this young fellow feels. I'm basically sinless. And uh, therefore you should listen to me. And then he goes on, talks about God. Look in this, you are not righteous, verse 12. I will answer you, God is greater than man. Why do you contend with him? He does not give an accounting of any of his words. For God may speak in one way or in another. Yet man does not perceive it in a dream, in a vision. So he's going to talk about God now. And that's not going to help Job to understand why he's suffering or how to get through this time of feeling unjustly used. But he's just talking. And sometimes we just talk without trying to get to the point. And that's what's going on here. Uh, verse 19, man is chastened with pain on his bed, with strong pain in many of his bones, so that his life abhors bread, his soul succulent food. So all this is true, but it's irrelevant. And when you're counseling, when you're trying to comfort somebody, we should listen and hear from God and then just give what God has in the way of encouragement. Verse 23, if there's a messenger for him, a mediator, one among a thousand to show man his uprightness, then he is gracious to him and he says, deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. So he's going on about God. Uh, and his sovereignty. Verse 29, God works all these things twice, in fact, three times with man to bring back his soul from the pit, that he may be enlightened with the light of life. Give ear, Job, listen to me. Hold your peace, and I will speak. If you have anything to say, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify you. If not, listen to me. Hold your peace, and I will teach you wisdom. If there was anybody who repeated himself, it's this man. He goes on and on and on. 
Ever know anybody like that? <laughs> oh, they just they repeat themselves. Um, we used to have a pastor here who uh, uh, was a bit wordy, and uh, his prayers over their food, uh, you better have cold meals because whatever you had would be cold eventually. And um, his 14-year-old son would say as they were at the table, Dad, don't start in Genesis, you know, just to get to the point. And um, chapter 34, he's talking about the justice uh, of God. Elihu further answered and said, Hear my words, you wise men. Give ear to me, you who have knowledge. The ear tests words as the palate tastes food. Let us choose justice for ourselves. Let us know among ourselves what is good. For Job has said, I am righteous, but God has taken away my justice. That's true. He said that. Should I lie concerning my right? My wound is incurable, though I am without transgression. What man is like Job? Now he starts to get personal. Now he's going to start to get negative. What man is like Job, verse 7, who drinks scorn like water? So he just drinks scorn or derision. He likes to deride people. There's no evidence of that. The Bible tells us he's upright. But he drinks scorn like water. He goes in company with the workers of iniquity, hangs out with bad people. He walks with wicked men. For he has said, it profits a man nothing that he should delight in God. He never said that. He never said it's not good or worthwhile to profit in God or think about God. So listen to me, you men of understanding. Far be it from God to do wickedness and from the Almighty to commit iniquity. For he repays man according to his work and makes man to find a reward according to his way. Surely God will never do wickedly. Well, that's true. God does not do wickedly. But that doesn't mean that what is happening to Job is not allowed by God. Remember now, Satan had to ask permission to lay a hand on Job and all his possessions, didn't he? So there's a hedge around each one of us, according to the book of Job and other scriptures as well. We have a hedge, a protection. How many know what a hedge is? You have a hedge on your property, perhaps, tree line, bushes, what have you, that demarcates your property from somebody else's. Ever see a mother with a young toddler or a kid two or three or four or five? Hedge. Can't see the hedge? It's there. That kid can't go any further than that hedge. Maybe the hedge is mother's arm. Maybe it's a brother or sister grabbing them. Uh, Or like my uh, stepdaughter has with her her one-year-old, she's got a little harness on, like a dog leash. So (laughs) I have my dogs on leash, she has her baby on a leash. That's That's the hedge. And that's the protection. And that hedge is there to keep Satan from coming any closer to us than God allows. But if God is coming closer than we think he should, lest we complain against God, we can say, God, help me to understand the hedge, that thank God it's not worse, they're not coming closer, but help me to understand the lesson I need to learn from this. So Job is going to give us that advice. When you are going through suffering, never challenge God, never question God, but you could ask him, if I've done something wrong, show me, show me how to go through this how to go through this with grace, and how to pray for all other people in the world going through exactly the same thing. So he goes on to talk about uh, God, and uh, it's totally irrelevant. And uh, when you're trying to comfort somebody, you ought to be on, on target to try to help that person to see what's really going on in his life and how to change. Um, He goes on to say in verse 31 of chapter 34, Has anyone said to God, I have borne chastening? I will offend no more. Teach me what I do not see. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. So it's good to ask God, have I done something wrong? Is what I'm going through because of something I have done wrong? If so, show me. If not, then help me to endure this. And if it's the devil, devil take a hike in Jesus' name. But we should not be... Uh, complaining against God, uh, saying this is not fair. We're not sure what God's trying to do in our lives. Verse 33, should he repay it according to your terms, just because you disavow it? You must choose and not I, therefore speak what you know. Men of understanding say to me, wise men who listen to me, Job speaks without knowledge. So now he's accusing Job of speaking without knowledge. His words are without wisdom. Oh, that Job were tried to the utmost, because his answers are like those of wicked men. 
So I just wish, Job, you were tried to the utmost. You are so, so wicked. All because of the fact that they're accusing him of sinning. He says, I haven't sinned. God is not just in what he's doing. And they're attacking him as a result. He adds rebellion to his sin, verse 37. He claps his hands among us, multiplies his words against God. So he's building this accusation. to Verse uh, 1 of chapter 35. Now Elihu's going to condemn self-righteousness. Here's his third speech. He's going to defend God's sovereignty. He's going to say that uh, uh, God's not affected by man's conduct, nor influenced by man's pride. And all these fellows are trying to defend God. And God does not need defending. When you find somebody who is in a serious situation, needs counseling, is suffering, that person is apt to attack God especially if that person knows there is a God and God is sovereign. If he's sovereign, why is he allowing this? And so there's that tendency to attack. And then there's a tendency on the counselor's part to try to defend God. And then the counselee resists and the counselor presses. Next thing you know, you've got to fight. And that's what's going on here. We don't need to defend God. God is. God is. And for a mind that's set against that, you're not going to be able to persuade that person anyway. What God wants for us to do is to come alongside that person and lovingly direct that person uh, to see that God does have a purpose and a plan, even if we can't see the whole thing. Um, but there is this tendency we have to defend God, and in so doing, we really dig our heels in and become adversaries of the counselor, the counselee. Chapter 35, Elihu says, Do you think this is right? Do you say my righteousness is more than God's? For you say, what advantage will it be to you? What profit shall I have more than if I had sinned? Every time we think God is wrong, we are making ourselves more righteous than God, aren't we? Every time we are complaining about our situation, we're making ourselves more righteous than God. It's like a court of law. We have different levels of the court. We have town courts. We've got the justices of the peace. Move on up to city court, county court, supreme court. In this state, it's court of appeals. Most states, it's Supreme Court. United States, it's the Supreme Court. And so the higher courts, in most cases, can overrule the lower courts. But every time you and I complain against God, we become the highest court, and we overrule God. That's a dangerous position to be in. Well, Job's been complaining, and he's in a dangerous position here, and God needs to straighten him out. But these fellows who are trying to defend God are not pleasing God either. We're going to see next week in chapter 30, uh, at the end of this uh, chapter 38, when God comes on the scene, he has nothing good to say about his friends. He says, they have spoken what's wrong about me. They've been declaring God's sovereignty and goodness. And God's going to say, they're wrong. Yes, he's sovereign. Yes, he's good. But you say those things with the right heart, not to condemn or beat somebody, and their motives were wrong. What is God going to say about all this speech of Elihu? Nada. He won't even address it. He pays no attention to anything Elihu is saying. That's sad, isn't it? All that talk, and God's not even listening. All right. He says here that, uh, let's go on and pick up at, uh, verse uh, 1 of chapter 36. Elihu proceeded and said, bear with me a little, and I will show you that there are yet words to speak on God's behalf. I will fetch my knowledge from afar. I will ascribe righteousness to my maker, for truly my words are not false. One who is perfect in knowledge is with you. Isn't that great? That sounds a little blowy, doesn't it? But let's be honest. As we are discussing with other people's situations, home life, politics, whatever, are we not taking the attitude sometimes we're perfect in knowledge? And certainly when we tell God that what he's doing with our lives is not good, and we are that court of appeals, we are perfect in knowledge. Because who are we worshiping? Who are we submitting to? If we worship self and submit to self, then we are in our own minds perfect in knowledge. Verse 5. Behold, God is mighty, but despises no one. He is mighty in the strength of understanding. He does not preserve the life of the wicked, but gives justice to the oppressed. 
And so now the conversation is getting a little bit uh, erroneous. Yes, God is mighty in strength. He does not preserve the life of the wicked. Is that true? No, there are many people around here who are living a long time. I know some folks who are pushing 95 and 96 who, in my opinion, are among the most wicked people I've ever known. God's given them time perhaps to repent. I don't know. But uh, they live a long time. We've all lost loved ones who were good and godly people who died very, very young. So that doesn't always work out. We can't judge God on how long somebody lives. Uh, He does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous. That's true. But they are on the throne with kings, and he has seated them forever. Doesn't always feel like that, but Paul says, yes, we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, even here. Um, Verse 9, he tells them their work and their transgressions. They have acted defiantly. He also opens their ear to instruction, commands they turn. See, all of this is mostly true, but totally irrelevant. Verse 13, the hypocrites in heart store up wrath. Yeah, eventually they'll have wrath. They don't cry for help when he binds them. They die in youth, not necessarily, and their life ends among the perverted persons. He delivers the poor in their affliction and opens their ears in oppression. Uh, And so he goes on and on, just talking, just to hear himself talk. When I was young and we used to have those uh, Victrolas, are you... uh, Old enough to remember those things, the Victrolas and the, uh, the, the vinyl and the, the needle. Well, you, someone would used to talk and talk and talk. We'd say he was vac- vaccinated with a Victrola needle. He just simply went on and on and on. Uh, verse 22, God is exalted by his power. Who teaches like him? Who has assigned him his way? Or who has said you are done wrong? Well, we do at times. Every time I go my way instead of God's way... Um, Every time I tell God that what's going on in my life is not good and fair and right, I am teaching him, aren't I? Who has assigned him his way? I like to tell God what he should be doing at times in my life, if I'm not careful. Or who has said you've done wrong? Let's be honest. Have we said to God he's done wrong? Oh, yes. Every time we complain, we're saying that. One time I was complaining, and the Lord said to me, "Um, the devil just loves to hear that. And I was questioning God, what does that mean? And he said, the devil loves for you to complain. It's a lousy advertisement for my love and provision and care. And he just loves to have people who are complaining against God. So you ever meet a husband or a wife who complains about the spouse when the spouse is not there? How's the marriage going on? And a lot of negativity? Well, that's not very flattering to the spouse, not very strengthening for the marriage, and in the wrong circumstances, it opens the door to another suitor to come in and play around and cheat. And the devil's the same way. Every time we complain, the devil loves the fact that we're unhappy with God, and he likes to come on in and become the other suitor and take us down the wrong road. Well, verse 24, Elihu is proclaiming God's majesty. Remember to magnify his work of which men have sung. Everyone has seen it. Man looks on it from afar. Behold, God is great and we do not know him, nor can we number his years. He draws up drops of water. Now, these guys knew a lot about, uh, this guy should have been a meteorologist. He draws up drops of water which distill as rain from the mist which the clouds drop down and pour abundantly on man. Can anyone understand the spreading of clouds, the thunder from his canopy? Look, he scatters his light upon it and covers the depths of the sea. For by these he judges the people, gives food in abundance, covers his hands with lightning. His thunder declares it, the cattle also concerning the rising storm. So he knows all about the weather. So what? What does that have to do with helping Job to draw closer to God in his time of discomfort? And then in chapter 37, he goes on to talk about uh, God and nature. At this also my heart trembles and leaps from its place. Hear attentively the thunder of his voice, the rumbling that comes from his mouth. He sends it forth under the whole heaven. A voice roars, he thunders with his majestic voice. He does not restrain them when his voice is heard. God thunders marvelously with his voice. He does great things which we cannot comprehend. He says to the snow, fall on the earth. Likewise to the gentle rain and the heavy rain of his strength. He seals the hand of every man. 
that all men may know his work. The beasts go into their dens, remain in their lairs. From the chamber of the south comes the wind. By the breath of God, ice is given, and the broad waters are frozen. Also with moisture, he saturates the thick clouds, scatters his bright clouds. They know all about, uh, about the weather and the meteorology uh, point of view here. So verse 14, listen, Job, stand still. Consider the wondrous works of God. Do you know when God dispatches them and causes the light of his cloud to shine? Do you know how the clouds are balanced, how those wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge? Why are your garments hot when he quits the, or quiets the earth by the south wind? With him have you spread out the skies, strong as a as metal mirror? So teach us what we should say to him. We can prepare nothing because of the darkness. So he's going on and on, just talking about uh, irrelevant things, which God will pay no attention to next week. As for the Almighty, verse 23, we can't find him. He's excellent in power and judgment and abundant justice. He does not oppress. Therefore, men fear him. He shows no partiality to any who are wise of heart. So as we look at these chapters, we're not getting anywhere. Uh, chapter 32, we see youth just exaggerating and full of itself. Chapter 33 uh, takes great patience to hear a condescending young critic or even an older critic. It's very, very difficult, isn't it? And in chapter 36 and 7, um, we're realizing that Elihu's not operating in love, nor are the friends. The real key to counseling is love. I took a lot of courses in seminary on counseling. Never, ever saw that word love mentioned in any of those, those courses in counseling. It's all about love. When you love, you'll find a way. Lord, help me to love and help me to come to this person and help me to uh, share with this person your love. This person's unhappy. This person's angry. Um, and incidentally, this is not going to end. These guys would go on and on and on if God didn't finally cut it off. Uh, chapter 38, which we're going to cover next week and following, um, listen to how the Lord starts this all off. Who is this, talking to Job, who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge, saying this to the friends as well. Now prepare yourself like a man, I will question you and you shall answer me. Then the Lord starts, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? And he goes on to ask these questions of Job and parenthetically the friends as well. And uh, he goes on to say, what do you know about anything? And um, I realized that with all due respect to scientists of all different sorts and all different fields and disciplines, scientists spend their lives profitably and productively discovering what God has already created. They're not going to create anything. Nobody creates anything. They're just discovering what God already knows. And in many cases, the scientists today don't know half of what they knew here in Job 4,000 years ago. And so consequently, uh, we find here that Job is going to have an attitude that he is repenting. He looks at the Lord and he is absolutely, uh, he looks at himself and he's horrified at his condition. I want to talk about one thing I mentioned uh, twice before. I think it's a, it's a good lesson in counseling. Um, my wife Kelly and I were called to uh, go visit somebody who was going to have an operation uh, in a nearby hospital about two months ago. And um, we were told he was very unhappy. We were warned about that. Um, one of our elders, another gentleman who had just finished talking to him, the uh, head nurse on duty was... Uh, uh, talking to him. He was angry. He felt the nurses had been blowing him off and not paying attention. Uh, he wasn't getting answers and he wanted to go to another hospital. And they had already had the operation set up for Friday and he blew that off and it was now Sunday and he was as hot as a pistol. So uh, we came in and I felt with all my counseling to just be quiet, let my wife uh, take over. She's a nurse. She's experienced in this. And uh, the Lord just said, watch and observe. And uh, Kelly began to uh, listen to him, and he vented. And she listened and listened and listened. Let him vent completely. And doctors and nurses know about this, and caregivers know about it as well. Let him vent. 
And as she vented, as he vented, she listened, and then instead of attacking him the way these friends did, she said, well, I can see some truth in what you have to say. And they should be aware of this, and they should be sensitive to that, and you should be entitled to this. He began to relax. He had somebody who was listening to him and was not saying he was crazy, not arguing with him. And so he began to relax, put his defenses down. She continued to say, and so this is a difficult situation. You must be in a great deal of pain, etc., etc. And then when he was relaxed, she said, but remember this. They also have their point of view, their difficulty. And when you are sharp and critical, they get a little defensive. They get a little afraid of you. And so therefore, they might be a little bit short or wary of you. And he understood that. And so then, finally, I said, this man's father is a minister. He has respect for it. And he said, what should I do? And I said, stay here. Get the operation done. Not my favorite hospital. Not the one I would recommend, but he was already there. They were ready to go. He went through the operation. He went fine. He's on his road to recovery. But had Kelly come in there or I come in there and said, you're wrong, you're worthless, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, and during this time, the head nurse heard this and she uh, did her best and then threw up her hands. During this time, the doctor came in and he listened and he also listened to Kelly. And... Uh, then he dismissed himself. And as we left and walked down the hall, the doctor came over us and said, who are you people? And uh, <laughs> we introduced ourselves. He said, thank you. Uh, so counseling is all about, well, yeah, you could say it was Kelly's nursing experience. Now, if you ask Kelly what her attitude about nursing is, it's based on love. She loves people. She wants to help people. I don't think there's a nurse or a doctor in that hospital that doesn't want to help people. That's what they're there for. We get defensive, we get argumentative, we get into a battle and get no place. But sometimes it's good for a fresh horse to come in and, and begin to direct our thinking here. Problem with these guys? They came in to hammer him down. All he wanted was someone to say, Job, I can only imagine how you're feeling. And I can understand the suffering that you're going through. And I can understand that you'd be critical of God. And I'm critical of God myself. And all of us are at times. And then he could have relaxed. And Job, you know, there's much in what you have to say. But could you consider this, Job? Is it possible that maybe God is trying to show you how to suffer, to bring glory to his name, so that you can see God move in your life? Is it possible that God would like to use you as a, as a demonstration of his grace? And could you allow God to heal? And don't you believe God's good? Instead of the sovereignty about God, God is sovereign. But he wants to work in your life. And so for us, I would say this, that you and I are showcases. We are testimonies. People are watching us. And we need to be good testimonies. We're looking at the book of Romans. And God is saying through Paul that we need to be provoking the Jews to jealousy. The Jews have largely turned against the Lord. And so God has gone to the Gentiles. We need to show God's grace and love and power and provoke them to jealousy. And then after I taught that Thursday night, Kelly mentioned to me at lunch with my sister, who is Jewish, stepsister, is Jewish. She was here last week. I didn't hear this comment, but as we were just living our lives, we weren't preaching, we were just living our lives. My sister Susan said to, to Kelly, you almost provoked me to jealousy because of your faith. So complain against God, whine and moan and groan, and no one's going to be jealous. No one's going to want, to, they want, to want nothing to do with Jesus. But praise him in adversity, even as Job did in chapter 1. Naked I came into this world, naked I go out. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But praise him and worship him and say he has a purpose. And oh, by the way, the antidote for all of the garbage here in the book of Job is Romans 8.28, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. This is going to turn out well. Oh, I may die in the process here, but I'll be in heaven and I'll receive rewards, but it's going to work out good. And I trust God. I trust God that that hedge is going to be just exactly where it should be. He won't give any more room to the devil than is good for my case. So we need to trust God. We need to bless him. 
And with that in mind, let's bow our hearts before the Lord. Father, we're grateful for this chance to have studied uh, scriptures and to listen to a lot of hot air from Elihu. Um, a lot of hot air comes from us as well, especially when we're complaining, when we're moaning and groaning. Help us, Lord, not to complain, not to moan and groan. Help us to trust you. And Lord, if we don't know you, Paul tells us in Romans 10 that you're in our mouth and you're in our heart. If we will confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus, that Jesus is Lord, and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So Lord, we're going to ask you to touch our hearts right now. Jesus, come into our lives. Live your life in us. We'll live for you. We'll serve you. And as we go through adversity, and yes, you promised there will be tribulation, but you said, be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. Lord, help us to go through this world graciously and gratefully, giving glory and honor to you. And help us to find someone who's suffering like Job. Come alongside that person, not to judge, but to encourage, to love, not to criticize. Put our arm around that person and say, I know. Or put our arm around that person and say nothing at all, but just be there. Help us, Lord, to be encouragers, to be lovers in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.